All right, well, let's get started. Uh, how many people are done with part uh, A of the project, the shell? Okay, so most people, that's uh, good. Hopefully everybody else is wrapping it up soon. Um, who, who is still having problems with the test? I think we had some minor problems this time, but hopefully it was smoother than last time. How many people have problems with the test? So, okay, just like a couple of people. So yeah, hopefully we'll get that straightened out soon. So uh, talk to me if it's not getting resolved. Um, and so today, uh, I don't actually have a lot of material uh, related to the projects themselves, but there's just like a few things that people are asking me different questions um, about different topics that I want to go over that, that I think will help you uh, become a better coder in, in general. So these four kind of unrelated topics are first, coding style. In particular, somebody asked a good question, and that is, uh, as you're writing programs, there's all these different return codes you have to check. And pretty soon, that looks like it's about like 80% of your code is checking all these return things, and it looks really messy. And so what kind of style should you use to uh, make your error handling clean? And then second, uh, people have asked about testing. I'm not going to really show you any framework, but I'm just going to show you how you might be able to write some simple Python scripts to do a lot of testing for you and handle a lot of cases, say, like if your program hangs or crashes or whatever. And then third, uh, Velgrind. Who's used Velgrind before? Okay, so I see two people. So this is actually a really nice tool. You, uh, you run it, and it tells you exactly what line you have your memory bug on if your memory bug is causing a problem. Um, so uh, I think you'll find that to be pretty helpful. And then, and then finally, we talked in a recent lecture about uh, swapping in our paging system and how we can kind of view memory as a cache for disk. And so today, we're going to be also using Velgrind to take some memory traces and then run some simulations on that to see how much memory we actually need to get a good hit rate for our programs. So let me dive into some coding style stuff. So when you're lear learning a new language, say like Java, like one of the most important things for you to do is to learn all the features, say uh, exception handling or things like that. I think you have to learn C a little bit differently because there's actually very few features and it doesn't take that long to learn those. So I think after you've learned all the features of C, what you need to learn next is the common design patterns. And the design pattern is just the way of typically doing something uh, like just like code that looks similar in a lot of different places, but it's not forced to be that way. Uh, so for example, instead of object-oriented programming, you might often see in C that people will have these uh, structures that have a bunch of function pointers in them. And that's kind of how you would do something instead of object-oriented programming. Uh, so today, what I want to show you is for error handling, in Java, we have these nice exception, uh, try-catch kind of features. And we don't have that in C. So I want to show you what we could use instead. So first, let me walk you through a little program I wrote here. So let me compile this. I just wrote a little version of uh, the CP program. So I'll run my version of CP here, and I'll copy, well, first, I'll just create a little file. And then I'm going to run my version of copy in this directory, and I'm going to copy that to uh, test2 and cap that. So you see how this works. And of course, if I, if I copy something that's garbage, it, it'll fail. Uh, so let's look at how we might write a program like this and how we do error handling. So right now, this is an example of a pretty ugly, ugly program. So the first thing we do here is uh, we get our input um, file descriptor. So if that fails, we return an error, simple enough. Well, here, first let me show you. So like, main is just calling this copy function with uh, an, an input file and an output file. So uh, we, we have a number of resources, right? We have to have our input file descriptor, our output file descriptor, and then also a buffer for in between. Uh, so here's where we're opening up the output. And now we see that if the output fails, this, is, this handling is a little bit uglier than if the input fails, because now we have to not only return negative one, but we have to clean up uh, the input file descriptor, which succeeded. And then we do our malloc. And if that, that fails, that's even uglier, right? Because now we had two resources that were kind of hanging, and we have to clean those up before we return. Uh, if we go on farther, we have to do some reads. And if re re reads return something negative, we have to free all these things before we return. This should be a negative one, actually. And then we, once we've gotten some data, we have to do some writes. Do people know why? Can somebody tell me why 
we have to do the writes in a loop like this? We did one read, why can't we just do one write? Any thoughts? So even, even a simple call like write, there's like all these tricky things that you have to read about in the man pages. And in particular, if you do a very large write, uh, the file system may decide that it's only going to do part of that write, and you should try the rest of it later. So even though I call, let's say I call write with 100 bytes, it might only do half of that. So it might return that written as, as 50. So that's why uh, for, each, for each read I do, I try to read this buff max, which is one megabyte, and then however much I've gotten. So it'll tell me, this bytes will tell me how much I actually did read, and then I'm going to keep looping until, uh, until bytes is zero. Uh, so that's why we just have to do that there. But again, okay, we see that the write could fail, and there's a bunch of cleanup we have to do, and so on. And then if we succeed, then of course we again do more cleanup. So do people have suggestions? How could we avoid doing the same cleanup in so many different places in our function? Does everybody just do all the cleanup all the time, or...? So kind of what, we, what we're hoping to do is we would like to be able to do all the cleanup in a single place, right? But then whenever there's an error, we want to go to that place. So I think what actually really works nice here is a go-to, right? In, in Java, like people like hate go-to's because in a lot of languages you don't need them, right? If you have a try-catch and there's an error, you just jump to the error handling place. But in C, uh, it's actually pretty useful. And actually if you um, look through any Linux source code, you'll see that go-to's are used very heavily. So let's, let's rewrite this program. And the way we can do this is up at the top, we have our, our resources. And I'm going to say fn equals negative 1. So I want, to, I want to somehow initialize all these so it looks like they're not being used. And where I have my buffer down here. So I can tell, like, if it's in this initial state, I can tell that nothing needs to be cleaned up. And now what I can do is when I get down here, if, if I have a problem, I just go to, I'm going to create an error handler at the end. So let me, let me clean this up here. So same thing here. Um, again, if not buff, I'm just going to go to my error handler. And this is starting to look a lot cleaner, right? And so forth. I'm almost done here. So it's a lot of code. We're doing a lot of shortening here. All right, so now I think we only have this one return point. So now what we can do is we can create an error handler at this point. So I'm just creating a label here. So all these go-tos, when I call the go-to, I'll just jump down here. And then I want to do cleanup and return an error message. But the thing is, is I don't know where I'm coming here from. So I want to write some code like that looks something like this. I want to check if each of these resources has been used or not. And then I can have a nice, uh, a nice clean um, cleanup here at the end. So if buff, what did I do here? Um, right, so now I can handle all these things in one case here. And if I really wanted to be fancy, I could even, I could even do something like I could have a return code. And I could have, uh, well, here, let me show you here. I could do something like what I have over in this other file, which is I could set a return code right to zero right before I do the cleanup. And that way, if I just fall through to error, uh, it'll get set to zero, otherwise it won't. So let me just go back there and do that. So with success, then I want to say something like return code equals zero. Otherwise, I would start off. At the beginning, it needs to be negative 1. OK, so now, now we've cleaned this up, right? We, we do all our cleanup in only one place, uh, whether we succeed or fail. Um, if we jump here, the return code is negative 1. Otherwise, it's 0. So does that make sense? Um, any questions about that, that style of error handling? Yeah. Um, 
You're saying you have one function to do all the initialization? So you could potentially do that, but like there's, um, it, it would be more tricky, right? Because uh, we can't do a go to from one function to another. All the go tos have to jump to another place in the same function. And then also, then we would have to have a bunch of places where we still um, return negative one, right? So, so you could you could do something like that. I mean, I could put this here, still here, but I, th I still think like the go to is a useful way of handling this. Other questions? So let me, so if you use this style as a lot of people use, there's some pitfalls you have to worry about. So let me, let me show you actually uh, a bug I found that actually a very good engineer at Facebook did. Um, and see if you can tell me what's wrong. Oh, I didn't have that. Uh, this is not supposed to be. Let me compile this to make sure I'm actually showing a good example here. And if I type something else like that. Okay, so this still works. Let me jump back here. Okay, so let me let me introduce a bug now and see if you can tell me why you shouldn't do this. Okay, so now there's a bug. Um, I'll let you. Does anybody see what the bug is? You can think about it for a bit if you want. It's kind of subtle. What's it? A memory leak. Um, worse than a memory leak. What's that? Right here? Um, what's wrong with this one? So I'm, I'm saying, this is saying, so if malloc fails, it returns null. So that's what this was doing, right? If, if malloc returns null, it would fail. Yeah, what's it? Uh, it's like the FN or the FL failed into the error handler. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what the problem is. So because I do the open here, which may fail, buff might never did initialize. So I could totally skip past this initialization down to the error handling down here, and then I could see, oh, buff is not equal to null because it's just some garbage thing, and then I could try freeing it, and then I would have a seg fault, right? So when you do this kind of uh, style where you have your error handler at the uh, end of the function, um, in that case, it's generally good uh, to avoid these kinds of things and not have to think about it as much. It's good if you can put all your uh, initialization at the very top, all your variables at the top. And I think this is one of the things that uh, a lot of, if you read a lot of tutorials or things, there'll be a lot of things in like good C style, but they don't always tell you why. So this is one of the reasons why people say put all your variables at the top of your function or uh, put parentheses around your defines, right? They don't necessarily always explain the reason, but it's good to think about these things and then follow these patterns and you'll avoid a lot of bugs that way. So any questions before we talk a little bit about testing? All right, so I, I, I again have my, uh, my uh, CP here. Let me see. So I'm going to compile this now. And so there's a few things that, a few different ways we can write tests. Let me just pull up some code here and show you just a very simple way to write a test. So you could just say like write a function, a Py so this is Python. You should probably learn Python at some point on your own. Um, it's pretty straightforward, but hopefully it's pretty uh, readable even if you don't know it. So here we're just like calling this test function and it's going to return uh, a true if we pass the test and zero otherwise. And then this is just a very simple uh, thing here, right? We're writing an input file and then this process open call in Python um, is just running a shell command here. So I'm running a dot out, which is my CP program, and I'm redirecting the output to dev null because I don't really want to. I don't really want to see in my test program what it's printing to the terminal. All I care is whether or not it creates this output file, and then I just read that back and I see if it's the same. So let me let me run this quick. Okay, and then I just have some read file and write file things here for convenience. So let me just run this quick and see what happens. Okay, so that passes. So simple enough. So let's introduce uh, some bugs into our program. 
So for example, uh, after we do the read, I'm going to just uh, overwrite what's in our buffer with garbage. Okay, I just want a dot out. And, uh, oops, what's happening there? Okay, and there it fails. So um, that's fine. So you can write a simple test to uh, uh, handle these two cases, but there's other two other cases that we usually have to worry about. And one of those is what if our program crashes? And then second, um, what if our program just hangs forever? So let me show you, uh, let me, well actually first let me check which one of those uh, cases I want to handle first. Okay, I just want to ha handle the hang forever case. So I'm going to go back and edit the code now. Uh, oops. To that C. Um, so here down here, I'm just going to uh, introduce an info loop. Now I run my tests again. Well, why is it doing that? Oh, because I'm. Oh, wait. Um. Maybe our, oh, because this is probably, oh, it's crashing, so it never actually gets to that point. Let me just put the infinite loop at the beginning, and then we'll try this again. Oh, why does that, huh? Oh, I remember what, why it, it didn't do this. So before, I was using another way to execute a program. Sorry about that. Um, so another way you can run programs in Python is just like that. You can say like os.system and then run a, a command. And then, oops, and then if I run my test, then my test would just hang forever. Right, so somehow, uh, in addition to just checking whether I get the right or wrong output, I want to ha have some way to check for whether it hangs and then have like some sort of timeout. So I actually just grabbed some code on the internet here, which is in this library. And basically what this is doing is it's, it's again, creating a program with this uh, process open. But it's doing it in a separate thread. And then uh, you can actually terminate the process from another thread that's not waiting on the result. So let me show you how this works. Um, so I have test one here. So now in this case, we can have this uh, that I just showed you how. So this will run it from a separate thread. And then after three seconds, it will kill it. So let me run test one here, and you see that after three seconds it fails. So now we've had handled three cases, right? Like you, you finish soon, but you have the wrong output, uh, you hang forever, and then like the third case is what if the program um, just crashes and does something really awful? So uh, let me open up my program here again and introduce another bug. So where is my while? Mm. I should get rid of this bug too. Okay, so I'll get rid of this. And I'm just going to make it crash right away. And also I'm going to remove the test files here quick. And now, now this is crashing my Python program, right? Because like the output was so weird, like it, the files weren't even there, right? And there's so many things that the Python could, uh, could, could potentially have to check for. So then uh, what you probably want to do is in your test program, you probably want to do something like I've done here and basically wrap, wrap all your tests in a try-catch, right? So now we have a timeout around it and we have a try-catch in case anything really weird happens. And then basically I'm passing a function pointer here to the test catch. And then this should be able to test uh, handle just about anything. Uh, what did I do there? Oh, 
Oh, I just actually did type that. Huh. That's weird. Okay, and then it just fails quickly. The only other case besides these um, simple kind of crash cases or hanging cases that we have to worry about is maybe like some sort of sandboxing thing. For example, what if you're testing a program that's actually malicious and might overwrite other files? So well, I won't really talk about that today. So any questions on just like basic testing stuff, how you could like write a simple script to test your programs? A lot of people are interested in testing, apparently, so that's good. So, so no? So now let me show you uh, a demo of the Valgrind tool, and this will help you catch some memory bugs. So, so I'll let you look at this uh, for a minute. So there's a bug in this program. Um, do you see what it is? What is it? Yeah, exactly. I have an off by one error here. So I'm writing past the end of the buffer. Um, so if it did work, uh, this should probably print out uh, 55, right? Because that's the sum of the numbers from um, 1 through 10. So let's, let's try this. So I'm going to compile this guy. OK. Right, and it actually works, right? Just because I'm right, uh, accessing something past the end of the buffer doesn't mean it's always going to crash. Maybe I'll run it on some other computer, then it'll crash, right? So this is a pretty bad bug, right? Because it might not show up until uh, deployment. So I'm going to use my handy Valgrind tool, and I'm going to run it with main, and this runs for a while. Hmm. And it tells me, oh, there's an invalid write of size 4. Right, so this is at least telling me that there's a bug somewhere in my program. But right now, this is not very useful output, right? Because I don't know where the bug is or any of that. So, but if I recompile and I have this G for debug flags, I'll do that, and then I'll run Valgrind again. And you know this, this is pretty slow, right? This is probably uh, easily 20 or 30 times slower than if you aren't running with Valgrind. But OK, so now when I run it again and I have these, uh, the debug flags when I compiled, I get some more useful information, right? It tells me where the data was malloced, and then it also tells me where it was inappropriately accessed with a write. So if I go back there to my main.c, right, so it told me line 13, so it correctly identified that, and then it said it was being inappropriately used on line 17. So then at this point I could probably identify that and eliminate the bug, and then let's try this again. And now you see that malloc is happy, or, or, or now you see that Valgrind is happy, right? It's not printing any, um, it prints a lot of things, but it doesn't, it's, there's like zero errors and it doesn't say anything's been leaked or anything. So let me go back here quick and show you some other kinds of things it might do. Uh, any questions so far? Um, so let me, let me introduce another bug just so you can kind of see what the different types of output you might see are when you're debugging. So now uh, I'm doing it on the second loop. Uh, I'll do a bell grind again. Okay, now this time it's an invalid read, right? Because I'm just reading in the array at the wrong place instead of writing it. And why does it say size 4? What's that? Yeah, it's an integer, right? So it's just saying um, how big my, like, uh, like, how, like how big my write is that's out of, out of range. So let me go back and show you one other type of error that's kind of interesting. Uh, so let me get rid of this. So the other thing that it'll catch is if you have any memory leaks, right? If I don't free anything. I mean, here it's not too bad because I just stopped running, but in other cases, memory leaks are, are bad, right? And now we see that uh, we're definitely lost. There are 40 bytes definitely lost in one block, right? And it, it can't really tell me a line number for where uh, that leak is, right? Because it doesn't know where it was supposed to get freed. Um, but I think like if you run it with other options, you could potentially get traces of where it was uh, actually allocated and, and dig deeper. So that, that'll be a very useful tool for you um, as you're debugging your programs. So any questions so far before we move on to the next demo? All right. 
So the next demo, uh, we're going to do use Valgrind at dead end, but now we're going to get a trace of all memory accesses, and then we can run that through a simulator to see how, how much memory we need in our cache for different policies. So first, let me show you some different programs I've written. Uh, so the first one is just sequential. So what, is the, what do you think the memory pattern will look like this when I trace this? Any thoughts? So what, what, I mean, so here's the most of the accesses to the data, right? And so what, what pattern is this? We've talked about it in class before. Yeah, he's doing the right gesture. It's just, it's scanning every, every entry in this huge array over and over again, right? So in contrast with that, let me pull up another program. So that's the sequential one. Here's a stride. Oh, why did it do that? Uh, so I had sequential off. So here, here this is similar, right, but I'm doing the index is quite a little bit different. So what, what does this one do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So both of them keep looping over all the pages again and again. But in one case, we, we access the page just once, and in the other case, we access it um, 1,000 times, right, because we have four bytes and then uh, a 4K page, right? And then I just have one more program here, uh, which is RAND. And kind of to get a clean trace, I had to generate all the random numbers before, because otherwise there's a lot of, of code that involves that is involved in generating a random number, and that was just like polluting my trace and dominating it before. So at this point what I do is I get all of my random integers up front, and then when I have this loop down here, I just, I just use those randomly generated offsets. And then, then what I'm going to do is when I get the traces, I'm only going to look at like what happens after, after start. So let me, uh, well, actually let me compile one of these here. So I'm going to do the, let's do the stride. And now what do we want to do? Uh, we want to run lackey. So you see that Belgrind has all these different tools. I mean, in general, Belgrind just like can trace memory, so you can have a lot of different things built on top of that. So the tool is lacking. We want to get a trace of all memory, and the program is main. And then I'm writing all the output. Actually, I don't want all the output. I just want standard error to go to this trace file. So let me run this. Oops. Valgrind. Oh, did I say that right? Oh, I, I know it's wrong. I need to say uh, dot slash main. Okay, so I'm going to run that. And this is pretty slow now because it's, it's intercepting every single memory access to instructions or to data. So it's, it's just started now. It's just started doing the looping. What's it? Are these programs reasonable to use on large programs? I mean, if you let it run long enough. I think, uh, so I mean, it really depends on like how long you're running the program, right? I mean, you could have a huge code base and just run it on parts of it. So I mean, if you had some unit tests or something, this is probably great, right? Because you could, um, you, you, because like the unit test doesn't run that long or touch that much stuff, so. And then you could even like do distributed testing, right? Where you uh, ran bell grind on each of your unit tests on a different machine. So you could set up a pretty nice environment to use this. But yeah, people, like say at Facebook, people would use this um, to make sure they never have any bugs that are being executed. I mean, this won't, if, if you don't execute the code and there's a memory bug there, this won't find it, of course. But Okay, so this is done now. So let me pop up this trace. This is huge. 
Okay, so here, here's kind of uh, what the trace looks like. So it'll say either an I, an S, or, or an M over here, or an L. So this just shows that this is an instruction, and here's the address, and how many bytes. Here's it's doing a store to a different address. Here we have some L's for loads, and then the M's I think are just like atomic operations. Um, but anyway, we get all these addresses, and what we really want to do is we want to get a trace of block numbers. So for that, I've written this little program here uh, called convert. And you don't have to understand all of this, but basically once, like after, after start, so, so when the program starts running, it runs a lot of libraries things, and that like kind of dominates the trace. But after start, I start looking for any of these things, and then I'll strip out that line, the address, and then this int adder 64 is just converting the hex to an integer, and then I'm dividing by the page size. So let me, let me run that now. So I want to cat my trace to convert that pi, and I'll call that trace2.txt. That'll run a short while. or a longer while, I guess. I didn't recall it taking this long before. It's doing something. Okay, there it's done. Okay, so let me pop this guy open. Trace2.txt. Uh, yes, I want to open that. And now, now we see all these different memory operations. So these are all just page numbers. And we saw before when we ran it that the buffer started at 16868. So I'm just going to cat this out. And I'm going to grab for things that start with 168. And just see how many of those there are. So there's about 3,000 of those. And then I'm just trying to actually get rid of that. And well, I guess there's more than 100 pages, right? But I guess so. Like I was reading through the trace earlier, and maybe only like 10% of them are for this thing. Most of it is I have to do memory accesses for updating my I, for loading my upper bound for my array into memory, all these things, right? So just because like we have this access, there's a lot of other access going on. So let's run a cache simulator on this now. So uh, for the OSTEP book, you have, um, there's a bunch of different Python homeworks that you can play with that are associated with this. Uh, I was going to use that first, but it, it's kind of slow if you want to simulate a large cache just because it was like doing, uh, looping over uh, uh, a linked list to find an item to evict. So basically, um, I'm going to show you a faster version of that. So I'm, or I'm using an ordered dictionary here. Uh, basically, this is a fancy data structure that combines uh, a linked list and a hash table, so you can quickly tell if the item is in the list, but you can also quickly pop, uh, tell, like tell its order in the list and pop it off from the beginning or end. So that's great for a cache, right, because if I want to say do LRU policy, um, what I'm basically doing is I'm saying like the last item in the hash table was last accessed, so I can quickly tell if something is in the cache and then also tell what I should evict, right. So I'm, I have different policies here. Uh, but basically, I'm looping through this trace. Each line, if you recall, was, uh, was a page number. And so I'm keeping track of the total, total pages access. And then if that line is in my cache already, that's a hit. And then you see that I, I'm popping it off here. And then this is pushing it back on the end. So I maintain the, my hash table will always be in order of when things were last accessed. Right? And then when I have to, when I have to miss, if there's not enough space, then I have to evict something, and I can either evict the first thing or the last thing since it's this linked list, right? So I'm going to run that uh, for various cache sizes from 4 to 4096. So when I'm running 4096, how much memory is that? So what what are so what what are the items in our cache? Do people have any questions in general? Are people following a lot? Or? So 
So we, ha we have this trace, right? We have, let me open that. So what, what are each of these? What's that? It's not quite an address, right? So an address is what we had in this, in this one. So here, here's, here's the actual address, right? Like these were pointer values. Yeah, page number, right? I, I ran a script on that to get page numbers, right? And now, um, uh, why is I doing that? So now either a page is in cache. Uh, whoops. So now a page is either in cache or not, right? So when I'm uh, setting the size, you see, like, right, if the size of the cache is greater than or equal to size and I have to evict something, so how much data can I fit in this cache then uh, for the largest size of 4096? So each item in the, in the cache, how much data does that represent? The page size, right? So each item in the cache is four kilobytes. And then we can have up to uh, uh, 4,000 items in the cache, right? So then we just, we basically, the largest cache size I'm simulating right now is 16 megabytes, right? And that should be, I mean, it's a pretty small program, right? So this should be big enough in general for most stuff. So let me, let me run this cache simulation now. And I have to feed in my trace too. Now this is kind of slow, right? Because there's a lot of, I think there was like hundreds of thousands of, no, there's actually millions of accesses for this simple little program. Yeah, it should be faster than that though. Let me check that I didn't do anything wrong here. And where's my trace.txt? Uh, well, that seems pretty reasonable. Let me just run it a little bit longer. Otherwise, I also ran this beforehand, so I have all the output files. Maybe I, I walked away and like forgot how long it actually took but I, I do have the data from running all of these. All right, this is boring. Um, so let me, basically, I have these three data files. So basically what that would have um, shown is this right here. So here along uh, the, the very first column is the cache size and number of pages. And then I also have the LRU hit rate and then the MRU, the most recently used hit rate. And then I also did that for in addition to the stride that's accessing one, uh, one word in each page, I also have the sequential program. Let me print that out. Uh, so you can kind of see, right, like the MRU doesn't do so well in a lot of cases. Often the hit rate is very low, whereas the LRU tends to do better. And then let me show you random. And then like the random also even though, so like, what's interesting, like I was actually surprised by these results initially because I thought, oh, when I have this scan pattern, the MRU should be doing a lot better. The reason it doesn't is because um, most of the accesses are to uh, instructions or also say like the I variable or things like that. So even, even if, like if by array, it looks like it's some other scan pattern, uh, it doesn't necessarily end up like that when you consider all the other memory accesses. So I ended up plotting all these and let me just open them up for you. So uh, first, let's just look at the random one. OK, so the LRU is on the top here. And we see that uh, for the random accesses, you actually uh, get a fairly good hit rate even just with four, four pages, right? And that's because most of the accesses are to code, right? But then MRU does terribly unless it's really, really big, right? Um, Let's look at the sequential. So sequential actually, uh, <clears throat> uh, LRU does amazing, even with very small sizes. And, and even the MRU, it does pretty well pretty soon, right? Because like when we're doing this just sequential scan, 
we do uh, 1,000 accesses for each page. So it's very easy to get a very high hit rate for this workload. And then, uh, what is the other one? Stride. This one has one point on the axis where MRU actually does slightly better, right? Because um, we do still have that scan pattern which LRU is bad at. So even though um, LRU does better for all the code stuff, there is one sweet spot where uh, most recently used eviction does slightly better. So those are all my demos. So uh, I guess, do people have questions about anything? Otherwise, I mean, it's fine if we have a short discussion. I'll hang around and answer people's questions about the projects for a while. Any questions? All right. Sounds good.